Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you at church this morning. It's good to see some folk back with us who maybe haven't been here in a while. You're obviously very welcome, and we welcome those of you, those of you who are watching at home. Uh, you're all very welcome. We know we've some over in the hall, and you are also very welcome to our service. It's really good to be back with you again. It's good to see uh, the numbers strong this morning. We had a, a lovely break. We were spending most of the time just up in Castle Rock, as was half of Northern Ireland by the, the feel of things. But it was great just to be there and get some good weather and some great time with family and friends. We, we thank you for your prayers. But it's good to be back again, and it's good to be back in a sense the start of a new season, even though it's not quite what we want. It is still good to be back into a sense of, of a page turning and moving forward. I want to read a short passage taken from Matthew's Gospel. Matthew writes the words of, of Jesus himself, when he said, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known on what part, in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Let's come before God as we worship Him. And we're going to stand together and we're going to sing, even with our, our masks on, we're going to sing to God's praise the wonderful words of Speak, O Lord. It's a, a song that's been written as a prayer, and so we're going to prayerfully sing it as we ask God to come and bless our time together at the start of the service. Let's stand together and sing to God's praise.
this and I stood ourselves as we come to God in prayer. Let's pray together. May the God, this morning as we come into your house to worship you, we come wanting to worship you because you and you alone deserve to be worshipped. There is no God apart from you. There is no love compared to the love that you give to us. There is no hope in this world aside from the hope that we have in you. There is no one we can trust with our whole lives in the way we can trust you. Therefore, we worship you. We marvel at the fact that you want our company, often more than we want yours. That you love us no matter what we have done in the past. That you loved us enough to send your only son into this world to die for us before we knew you. That you promised that if we trust you, that you will never leave us or wash your hands of us, no matter how far from you we stray. And so Lord, we marvel at the fact that you are prepared to call people such as us, who are perhaps nothing in the world's eyes, call us into a relationship that allows us to be named as children of God. Each and every day you come to us with your hands held open and you offer to us the greatest gifts of your love and your forgiveness, blessings of many kinds, assurance and peace that the world cannot understand and a joy that the world can never take away. And so, Father, as we think about these things and as we pray, we ask that you would forgive us for all that is in us that is wrong, our lack of empathy, our lack of sympathy, our ability to take for granted our loved ones, the pride in self and the way in which we enjoy putting others down. Forgive us for our personal sins, the sins that no one else has heard of because we keep them so private, the sins that are hidden from others and yet fully known to you. Father God, help us understand that you are serious about us in every aspect of our lives, and in doing so, enable us in every aspect to be serious about you. Hear our prayers this day and accept the praise offered from our hearts. For we do ask it through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Now this morning we're opening a new book in the Bible, one which I'm sure you've read before, but the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to read this morning Mark chapter 1, just verses 1 to 8. And Chris is going to come read that for us. John the Baptist prepares the way. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a belt, a leather belt, around his waist, and he had locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and unite. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, Chris. Boys and girls, do we have any boys and girls out this morning? It's called Meet Jesus in Mark, uh, his gospel in 24 readings. 
I already you're thinking to yourself, hang on, it's going to be 24 Sundays, are we going to be doing Mark for, I don't know how long we're going to be doing Mark for necessarily, but boys and girls, I want to recommend this book to you, it's great, it's got some lovely pictures, and what I want to do is, when the stories in this match the stories we, we do on a Sunday morning, I want to read you what it says. But the problem is, I would love to have you up the front and be able to show you the pictures, so I've tried to put the pictures on the screen. So let me start off this morning. You're going to hear basically the same reading that Chris read for us there now. But what I want is for the boys and girls in church and the boys and girls at home, as we all study Mark together, so we can, as boys and girls and as grown-ups, be together in reading the same book. So this is a picture of, let's pretend it looks a bit like Mark who wrote this gospel that we read. And these people that you see around Mark will appear in the story as we go through the story of Mark. Because when Mark sat down to read, read, write the gospel, he listened to what all the people have been saying to him about who Jesus was, the things that Jesus had been doing, and he put all the stories together in this wonderful account of Jesus' life. Now, the story starts, and it's very similar to the one you just heard. It says, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, began with words from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was a very old prophet. And Isaiah told people that John would come in the future and tell them to prepare the way for the Lord. John was John the Baptist, or sometimes called John the Baptizer, and he appears almost out of nowhere in the desert and called people to come to him. And here's a picture of John the Baptist. John the Baptist standing in the, the river, wearing this very itchy looking coat, and I'm sure I would not like to have worn that. And obviously he's let his hair grow and his beard's growing and he looks like somebody's come out of lockdown. But he's there inviting people to come to the water to be baptized. And there's this wonderful bit at the start of this story in this book. It says the gospel began. And Mark starts by talking about the gospel. And it was interesting, we had the word gospel on the screen and Chris read the words good news because the good news is the gospel. And Mark, we said, it says here, Mark will never talk about anything else. Mark will always talk about the gospel, the good news. Right to the very end of the gospel, he's telling the good news about who? About Jesus. So Mark's telling the story about Jesus from the very start, and he tells us directly who Jesus is. He doesn't pretend Jesus is somebody different. Mark's good news begins before Jesus, with John the baptizer in the water, and even earlier in the Old Testament, as we heard this morning from the book of Isaiah. And there's this lovely little prayer that's written at the start of this first passage, and it says, here's a prayer to help you as you read. And so we're all going to pray this prayer as I pray it aloud. God in heaven, please speak to me through Mark's gospel. Please help me to read carefully and to see Jesus for who he really is. Please help me to follow Jesus, both in the pages of Mark and in the different stages of my life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So boys and girls and mums and dads as well, this Sunday is really a preparation Sunday. This would normally be a Sunday to prepare us to come back for a new season. But we're asking God to come and prepare our hearts and prepare our minds for meeting Jesus as we study his word together in Mark's Gospel. And so I want to recommend this book, and you'll be seeing it a lot more over the next coming weeks. Now, different people aren't at church today. Some people are, are not well. Some people are still shielding. Some people are uh, coping with different other problems and difficulties. And so we, as we're here together this morning, we want to remember them in our prayers. So let's come before God as we intercede for these people. Let's pray together. Lord God, we give you thanks for your power. And we ask, Lord, that we might praise you and worship you today for all the ways in which your power has been made perfect in our weakness, especially during the coronavirus pandemic and the lockdown. And even now, Lord, we know that this has not passed, and we have to be so careful. And so we continue to ask that your power would be there for us. We pray that your power might be evident working in and through each of your people as we serve you, as we love others, as we talk to them and point them to Jesus. Lord, for some time now we have 
not been focusing on the topic of Brexit and seems to have come back into our news again. So this morning we pray for those negotiating Brexit, asking that you would enable a settlement that preserves the best of working relationships between the UK and the European Union and Ireland, North and South. We pray for those who will be most impacted by Brexit, including businesses and the farming sector, and those who live in border communities, asking that you, Lord, would help them to plan and prepare for what's ahead. We give you thanks, Lord, for the Creative Ways ministry has continued even during the lockdown period, during this period of uh, coronavirus pandemic. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to give leaders ways of keeping in touch and sharing God's love by normal patterns of communication, normal patterns of connection continue to remain disrupted. We pray for our uniformed organizations as they continue to work out new ways of programming as meeting together remains restricted by requirements of social distancing and the need to be responsible about health and safety. Father, we thank you that children are back in school and we continue to pray for our schools, we continue to pray for our staff, we continue to pray, Father, that you would help them to be vigilant and careful, but at the same time that teaching would be done as well as possible. We ask, though, that you would protect our schools, the children, staff, those who work in schools, and leave the Lord as they come home to extended families, that your protection would be there as well. We remember our congregation at this time, and although we have to be socially distanced from each other, in one sense, Father, we thank you that you've blessed us with two safe months of meeting together in this sanctuary. Like many more people come to accept that now is a good and safe time to come back to church. And might we begin to sense a reawakening in our fellowship and worshiping together. But Lord, we also want to remember some who would be with us today, but for the fact that their health prevents them. Some going through treatment, some waiting for treatment to start, some waiting for a diagnosis, others carrying and supporting the weight of a loved one who's just not well at the moment. And so we pray for all those, Lord, who are looking after or protecting friends or neighbours or loved ones during this time of need. Oh God, we pray for a, a fresh anointing of your spirit at the start of this new church year as we study Mark's gospel together. We thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ, good news that is relevant today as much as it was relevant during the day Christ himself walked with and talked to his disciples. And might we embrace afresh the, the living Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour and as our Lord today, perhaps like never before. And so we ask that you would speak to us through your word. And we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. When I arrived here at the start of lockdown, you may remember, way back at the end of March, start of April, I had taken time before I came here, before I knew of anything to do with the whole lockdown, I had taken time to try and plan through a number of months of my, my preaching. And all of a sudden it seemed that the, the preaching plan that I had put together was not as relevant as I wanted it to be. And so we took time, as you remember, looking through uh, the book of Philippians, and I believe it, it certainly spoke to us for where we were at that point in our, uh, in our calendar with this coronavirus lockdown. And we, we studied it through the spring and into the early summer, and then when we came to July and August, we looked at the, the wonderful book of Ruth. And today is, as you know, the first Sunday in a, a new term and a new season. September is usually that wonderful month in church life when things start up again, and uh, all of a sudden the revs start to move, and, and we, we move into a new period. Uh, but that's not quite happening just yet. There is a sense that we are moving into a, a new period. Obviously, we're in a situation that hasn't necessarily moved terribly far on from where we were three or four months ago. But it has been good to be back in church. And it's been good to be together, uh, especially over these last couple of months. But I really want to encourage folk who may be watching this at home to encourage you to think about and consider why uh, you're not maybe at church. We would love to see you here. We're missing you. 
We know many of you are shielding and we're praying for you, but we would really love to see you back with us on church on Sunday. And uh, we know it's not going to be right until we're all together again. But maybe now is a good time to start putting that back in action. The situation is as it is, as it is and we need to grasp it and we need to make the best we can of it. And so with that in mind, I'm, I'm starting this series in Mark, a series that I planned and hoped to start when I arrived here uh, quite, quite some time ago, it seems like now. I believe this is the right thing to do at this stage. And Mark's Gospel, I, I'm sure for many of you, of all the Gospels, is perhaps one of the best known of all the Gospels. It's said that Mark's Gospel is a simple, succinct, unadorned, and yet vivid account of Jesus' ministry. And that's really what we want. We don't want anything to get in the way of who Jesus is. Today we start to look at Mark's Gospel. When they finish it, it will most likely be in the new year. But we're going to start today and we're going to work our way through it. And each page we turn, each passage we come to is a new topic and a fresh look on something else. So it, it, it will never go stale. And through this, we will come face to face with the living Lord Jesus Christ. We will hear him speaking. We will see him perform miracles. And this isn't to be understood in any way as some sort of history lesson. Far from it. We call ourselves Bible-believing Christians. We base our lives on what the Bible teaches us. And so we have to believe that this is the Word of God, the living God. And so the living Word of God is available for us today to read, and study, to think about, to ponder over. And just to help us get that little bit more out of each passage, I, I decided to start doing the thoughts for the day again on uh, every morning. Those will be on, on our church Facebook site. And maybe try and get those moving onto YouTube if that's easier for you. But it's just to try and fill in the, the, the gaps that I might leave on Sunday morning. But it's, uh, it's an opportunity for us, as I said, to come face to face with Jesus and hear God speaking through him to each one of us. And certainly each one of us could do well to listen to what the Lord has to say. So first of all, before we start any book, it's always good to know a little bit about who wrote the book, who was behind the writing of it. There's a clue in the title of it, we call it Mark's Gospel, therefore Mark himself was the author of this gospel, or John Mark as he's sometimes referred to. Now what do we know about John Mark? Well, we know he was one of Jesus' followers, and we know from reading Acts chapter 12 that he was a believer who lived with his mother at home in Jerusalem. And their house was a house that very often the disciples would have gone to after maybe something had happened and been out working in the road or been away teaching or, or healing or whatever, and they would have come back to John Mark's mother's house and she would have looked after them. So we, we know this man was part of Jesus' ministry. Some scholars believe that he actually tries to write himself into his own gospel. If you read Mark 14, verses 15 and 51, there's a strange reference to this young man who, who fled the night Jesus was arrested. There's not terribly strong evidence for this, so we're, we're not going to necessarily say that that was Mark. But what we do know is that after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit had come upon the disciples, they then went from Jerusalem into Judea, and then Samaria and out into the outermost parts of the world. And one of those disciples we know was Simon Peter. And Peter went, and we know Peter taught, and we know Peter was used by God in many different ways. But we also know that Peter used Mark as his translator. And so Mark would have spent time with Peter, listening to Peter's accounts, seeing himself the things that Jesus had done. And some have suggested that this gospel that's been written, that we call Mark's gospel, could almost have been called the gospel according to Peter. What a wonderful thought. Today we're going to really take just a few minutes looking at these first eight verses of uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. And we're going to look at the testimony of, of three witnesses. The first witness is that of Mark himself. Mark writes, in the, be sorry, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now you could almost miss a very important thing at the start of this book. This, this inclusion of four words that are added onto what Mark says. Mark could simply have written the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ and left it, saying nothing more than that. He could have just had that statement and we'd have been satisfied with it. But Mark was on and he has these four very important words. The Son of God. 
You say to yourself, well, so what? What does that actually mean? It doesn't matter that much, does it? Because we know who Jesus was. So why does Mark include this? Well, Mark could simply have said this because he wanted people to know something maybe about himself. I'm sure there were those who knew Mark, those who maybe suspected that he was a follower of Jesus Christ. But maybe, maybe they actually needed to hear him say it for himself. I'm sure there were those who had grown up with him and had wondered where he was in his relationship with this person, this Jesus of Nazareth. But they were never maybe quite sure. Maybe Mark himself had never taken the time to, or, or found the courage even, to actually say the words for himself, to declare that this is what he believed. He wasn't going to leave it to the middle of the book. He wasn't going to just slip it in towards the end. But he wanted to make sure that people knew what he believed at the very outset. He wanted people to know that this was his belief and it could be their belief too. Maybe for you, you too have at times maybe been tempted to keep your own faith hidden. Maybe there are times when you maybe started a new job and you didn't want to necessarily go in and declare from the very outset that, that you were a, a believer in Jesus Christ. And because of that, the longer you left it, the harder it became to tell somebody about Jesus. But maybe those people looked at you and said, well, you know, are they, are they Christians? If they're not Christians, well, you know, that's fair enough, but if they are, why aren't they talking to us about it? I was really challenged in our, our time in Italy when we were thinking about putting up Christmas decorations outside the house. We lived in a, a small cul-de-sac. And there was a, somebody came to us and said, you know, if you don't put up the decorations outside, if you don't show yourself to be celebrating Christmas, you're going to confuse people. Because all your neighbors know about you. They're all talking about you. They think you're part of this cult. And they, they know you're followers of Jesus Christ. If you don't celebrate Christmas, then you're confusing them. And if you don't talk to them about Jesus, then they're going, if they're, if they're Christians, why are they not telling me about Jesus? And so I want to encourage you, whoever you mix with, whoever you spend time with, who maybe doesn't know about Jesus, let them know what you know. Let them know what you believe so that there isn't that confusion and that they, from the very outset, know that you have the answers that maybe they're seeking. Because when you think about it, we all know what Coca-Cola is, don't we? We all have tasted Coca-Cola or seen it. But Coca-Cola actually had very humble beginnings. It started in 1886. Dr. John Pemberton from Atlanta, Georgia, created this concoction in this uh, wonderful three-legged brass kettle in the backyard. And he then distributed what he called Coca-Cola to the local pharmacy <clears throat> by simply walking down the street with it in a jug. When he got there, it was sold to the public, and the factory started, and 130 years later, surveys show that 98% of the known world has heard of Coca-Cola. 78% of the world has seen a bottle, or a can, or an advert about Coca-Cola. 56% of the world has actually tasted Coca-Cola. All due to the fact that the company at the very outset made the commitment that everyone on the planet would have a taste of their soft drink. Incredible when you think about it. While 1.7 billion people worldwide have no access to the good news of Jesus Christ. Mark wanted people to know the good news of the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. But he also wanted them to know that this was his good news, and it could be their good news as well. And so perhaps this morning, as you're here today, you maybe need to hear some good news. Let me encourage you to stick with us through this series in Mark's Gospel, and you will get more than your fair share of good news when you hear about Jesus. So the first witness is Mark. The second witness really are the prophets, especially the prophet Isaiah. Mark tells his readers that this isn't just some sort of whimsical idea of his own, that uh, this idea came from long ago when the prophets introduced it. In fact, he quotes Isaiah, he says, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. It was the custom of kings in biblical times to announce that they were going to visit a certain area or a certain town. And as 
the time drew closer, they would then send somebody ahead of them who would act as a herald, in a sense, to announce that the king was coming and that they needed to prepare the roads so that the cavalcade that came through would have a smooth journey on the road. I don't know if you know about me, but I, I love the Tour de France. I love following the Tour de France. Every year, for a number of years in the past, we would have taken our, our camper van and followed the tour around the roads in France and stopped at the sides and shouted and cheered and clapped and all the rest of it. That's been a while since we've done it, but I still try to catch up with the ITD uh, recap on it. But one of the wonderful things about the Tour de France is that whenever the route is announced every year, whenever the, the course is published, all the local towns that it's going to go through get very excited because this is a privilege for them to have this cavalcade of riders and vehicles and all coming through their town. But the residents also get excited because that means that the local council is going to sort their roads out. They're going to fill in the potholes, they're going to put a lovely new surface down so that when the riders come through, they think, wasn't that a beautiful little village we came through, perfect roads, etc. And so every now and then you come across these little villages with wonderful surfaces. But the person who went ahead of the king wasn't just going to say the king is coming. He was coming to say the king is coming. Get yourselves ready. Get prepared. Get your life sorted out because the king is going to come and visit. And so the prophets announced that someday in the future God was going to send somebody to say the Lord's servant is coming. It's imminent. Get yourselves ready. Just a a quick aside here, a very simple point I think needs to be made. The people had been promised this Messiah. This wasn't something that John the Baptist suddenly told them about. But the, the promise of the Messiah happened almost 400 years before John the Baptist arrived. Promise was a promise that could be trusted. For many people, they probably had forgotten the promise. Sure, that was hundreds of years ago. God, God's part of the promise. God's forgotten about us. God is not doing anything about it anymore. Let's just get on with our lives. But no, God was fully prepared to keep his promise. And in keeping his promise, he allowed it to happen at exactly the right time he was ready for it. And maybe there are some here this morning, maybe some watching at home, and you're saying to yourself, you know, once upon a time I believe God gave me a promise. Maybe you're waiting for some of that promise to be fulfilled even today. Please, please, please don't be tempted to give up. Trust that God knows about that promise. Trust that God will keep that promise. Trust him because he is faithful. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9 says, Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And Hebrews 10 in the New Testament verse 23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Friends, though we are often unfaithful to God, though we make him promises and sometimes we break those promises, though we promise our friends, our neighbours, our, our loved ones at times, and then go on and break those promises, God is never unfaithful towards his people. So can I encourage you to, to rely upon God's faithfulness? The third and final witness that's mentioned here is, is John the Baptist. This, this man we saw in the little cartoon for the children, this person who suddenly sort of appeared out of nowhere. He was coming because he was the one that the prophets had been speaking about. The prophets said there's going to be somebody coming in the future who will announce the imminent arrival of the Lord's chosen one. What an incredible job. The person who would come to tell people Jesus, the Messiah, is about to appear. See, John the Baptist came. He said simply, what you were told about is about to happen. People listened to him. And we read that the people who listened to him all went out and joined him out in the wilderness. We read in verse 4, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and all those from Jerusalem went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is greater than I, whose sandals struck him and worthy to stoop down and loose. 
I indeed baptize you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So what's actually going on here? Well, when I read this, when I read this, I, I, I wonder, first of all, what was the difference in what John was saying and what the prophets had been saying beforehand? It was the same message that God's servant was going to come. Be ready. And yet the people who heard the prophets very often turned away and went back to their sins. And yet the people who heard John did the opposite. They turned from their sins and asked for repentance. And you could argue that the, the whole picture of what was going on here was that there was a sense of urgency to what John was preaching. Certainly it had been a long time since the prophets had ever spoken to these people, over 400 years, and all of a sudden somebody's come out of nowhere and the same things which the people were compelled to listen to. And so it was the urgency that was attached to what John was saying caused people to, to change their minds and to, to look at their hearts. And this word repentance that's used in the Greek, the word metanoia, it really means to, to change your mind. It's a turning around, but there's a that sense of, of repentance attached to it. If you think about what child, what child warned of their father's imminent return to the house doesn't quickly decide that they better apologize to their mom for the way they've been behaving before the father comes home. And here John is saying, prepare the way for the coming of the one who is much greater than me, so much so that I am not even worthy to be in his presence. He's so much greater than me. I've been baptizing you with water. He's going to baptize you with fire with the Holy Spirit. This meant something to the people. And they repented. And they, in preparation for Christ's coming, turned their lives around. And so this morning as I stand before you at the front of this church, for me, to tell, I have to tell you, I suppose, that each one of us, myself included, needs to look at our own lives and look at those areas that we really do need to change. For some, maybe it's a huge change, a big turning around. For others, there are areas which we constantly put off and said, oh, I'll get that sorted someday. But there's a sense that as we study Mark's gospel together, we will be coming face to face with the living Lord Jesus Christ, and we need to get ourselves together. And so I want to encourage you, don't say, well, you know, you know it took a long time before the prophets, uh, after the prophets spoke until John the Baptist came. It took a long time for Jesus to actually fulfill that promise. I know he says he's going to come back, but you know, I'll take my chances. I'll leave it a little while longer. Who knows? Let me echo Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 6. He says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And so if I've done nothing more today than simply announce the, the beginning of our study in Mark's Gospel about the good news of Jesus Christ, then I really do hope that we begin to make our way on this journey together through this wonderful book as we prepare ourselves for coming face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that we stand marveling at what you've done for us in Jesus that Jesus didn't come because uh, we forced the issue or because you couldn't wait any longer, but Jesus Christ came because it was the perfect time for him to come, because you had ordained the exact moment, the minute in time when Jesus would arrive in our presence. And so, Father, we, we praise a God this morning who has also set in time a day when Jesus himself will return. And Father, we don't want to come face to face with Jesus and not recognize him, and for him not to recognize us. And so we pray that you would allow us to prepare ourselves, that we would do all that we can, that we would read your word, we would do our readings, Lord, we would study your word, we would allow ourselves to, to share Jesus with others, that we would prepare our hearts and minds, Lord, for what you have to say to us as we study this gospel together. We thank you for it, and we pray that you would bless our time as we take uh, these weeks and months to look at this wonderful book. Go ahead with us by your spirit and prepare us hearts, minds, and spirits. For we ask that giving thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So we wonder what God has done for us and we close our service saying those wonderful words, and can it be? And we won't marvel what God has done for us wonderful things and not only done for us things we've experienced, but also he's prepared a future and a hope for us. So let's stand together as we sing these words, and can it be.
and now you may grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Rest and remain upon each one of us and all whom we love this Lord's Day, this incoming week, and forevermore. Amen.